Tom here from Lawrence Systems. SolarWinds went from a name that, well, lots of technical people knew, but the mainstream media probably never would have been able to really think about what that product was. After the events that unfolded in December of 2020, it has now become, well, mainstream news. And in February here of 2020, it became a Senate hearing and a 60 Minutes coverage. So it is now pretty much everywhere. People are aware of it. People are asking questions about it. And I did some videos about the initial attack vectors, kind of what we knew back then. I also did a video called it wasn't as easy as solar winds one, two, three, because this attack is much more complicated than just a bad password that was used. Not excusing bad passwords. It's just that there was a lot more to this than just a bad password. I'll also admit in the 60 minutes that this guy said, this was an, an act of cyber terrorism. The goal behind this was fear. And I think that's taking things way out of context. That's not what was going on here. This was not a terrorist act to put fear in us. The threat actor's goal was espionage. If they wanted to actually create a absolutely chaotic event, well, they had the right tool to do so. They chose to be quiet and clandestine with a list of targets that they wanted to exfiltrate data from, not cause total chaos, financial ruin, and some post-apocalyptic shut down all the systems. Which, by the way, if you're not familiar with what the SolarWind Orion system does, it happens to do like configuration management. That means it is in the center of all of your systems and has credentials to all of your firewalls and your switches and all of the infrastructure that runs all these companies. Companies. If they were to use this tool to flip a switch, turn them off, and delete all the configurations of, well, 18,000 major companies, and many of them I say major because we know that out of the Fortune 500 list, I believe 400 companies were on the list. If you talk about breaking the networks of that many companies simultaneously, you do talk about a real event that, well, we just read about in sci fi writing and things like that, where what happens when a major outage of the internet and infrastructure of all these computers go down, that is that type of event. This was a quiet, clandestine event, and the mistake the threat actors made was going after FireEye. That was where they actually were caught. The other companies they were able to get in, and this does include government bodies, that they, they were able to use and leverage this level of access that the SolarWinds Orion tool had. First, they compromise, compromised the SolarWinds Orion tool that turned into the compromise of all these companies that use Orion because it lives at the heart of their networks. And let's break down a timeline and clear up a little bit of confusion here. And Microsoft's deep dive was really good on this topic. Deep dive into SolarGate, second stage activation from sunburst to teardrop to raindrop. Now, one thing about Microsoft is they decided to call it something else. I'm not into the politics of fighting with security researchers who decide to name things differently, but they did at least do this. And I want to clear up this little piece of confusion. We have published our in-depth analysis of the SolarGate backdoor malware, also referred to as Sunburst by FireEye. I want to bring that up because sometimes people have asked, what's the difference between all of these? There are payloads, there are different uh, names for it and things like that. Specifically, we are going to be talking only here about what Microsoft calls SolarGate and FireEye calls Sunburst. But yes, there are things like such as TrustWave who were able to find some other flaws not used in this particular attack. So there are a few other things because security researchers have all jumped on rightfully so, diving into and seeing if there's any other flaws in Orion project that may have not been discovered. And of course, some were found. Anytime you take and really dive deep into software, you're going to find bugs. And when you take some of the most powerful and really talented security people, and they really put a lot of effort into it, they find a lot of bugs in software. That means right now, SolarWinds could be some of the most vetted software on the planet right now. And uh, I feel that there's probably other companies that may, were, may have been compromised. And we'll get into some of the details in the timeline, because one of the ways this threat actor did was by infecting the build server not the source code. That means the speculatively here, that process may have not only been used against solar winds because from a timeline, they came in, put the, put it in there, seen if it was unnoticed and later removed it. When we go to the timeline, the removal part's really interesting because if they hadn't attacked FireEye, we wouldn't know at all. And we don't know who else may have been attacked and targeted. And we don't know. That's a big piece. There may be someone 
who got into some of these systems, but then removed their access they had like they did with the solar winds. And if they wouldn't have gone after one of these companies such as FireEye, a forensics investigation company, it would be really hard for us to know how that happened. Now here's Microsoft's timeline of the attack. We have September is when the access begins, September of 2019. This is a real long game that was played here. So the initial access, they inject some code and they wait. They wanna see if anyone noticed that they injected code. They actually didn't deploy the back door all the way until February 20th of 2020. That's when they actually said, all right, now we're gonna actually push this build and deploy a back door. They just put some sample code in there. And when no one noticed it, they're like, well, let's go a step further. Let's keep pushing the envelope until we can get to where we need to be. Then comes May of 2020 when the hands-on activation of Target occurs. And hands-on means, well, hands-on. This is one of the reasons Microsoft said they believe there's as many as a thousand different people working on this project because they had a targeted list. They did deploy this and it was roughly 17 or 18,000 systems that took and loaded this update, but only companies that were targeted were the actual backdoor activated and then lateral moving across their network pursued. So it was very hands-on because they would methodically look for and craft how they were going to get from that particular server to other servers and how they were going to hide their tracks of how they got there. So they would infect the Solar Winds server that it was running on with the Orion software, and then it would move through the network laterally to get to another server and then try to hide how they got there. That way, if their other attacks would trip up an alarm or alert someone that they were there, you wouldn't know how they got there. This is essentially what happened with FireEye, which made them start taking things apart. Now we go over to the activation and then malware removed. This is also interesting. On 6420, it appears they removed the back door. Now this goes and adds to the confusion. If you were a regular updating customer and you loaded the update that had the back door in February, and then you load an update after 6420, the update fixed itself, so to speak. And now when you're trying to do your forensics, do you have all the previously version installed? And you got to remember, this wasn't discovered till December. So it took someone having an old version installed either because they didn't update it or they kept archives and images of each system from those dates six months prior to start forensically going through and finding this. This is just a pretty wild uh, investigation and hunt to find out as much as we know right now. And this gives us an overview of exactly how they got in there. We start with the attacker first, compromising the SolarWinds Orion build server. So that's this whole process down here of getting it there. Now, if that server, the SolarWinds Orion one, also had access to the internet, then it would go out to the back door and connect to their initial C2 server. They were setting up the command and control servers, C2 servers, for each individual target. So it wasn't like normal viruses and malware where there's a C2 server, it's easy to identify. All the attacks for that particular virus frequently would go to a C2 server or a series of them to kind of make it obvious for people watching the network and go, oh, yeah, we know that's on the list. Now, how they get these out and off the list was another interesting piece of this. They had registered domains that had been registered for a long time. We're not exactly clear. I Well, I should say I'm not exactly here. Someone may have some of the logs on this, but essentially these domains were registered a long time ago. They weren't new. That's important because one of the flags you're looking for if you're a security researcher is if you see a server beaconing out to a newly registered server on the internet, a new domain, especially if that domain is outside the US. They used domains inside the US. They used servers inside the US. They also used old domains that had been registered for a long time. Basically, everything they could do to not trip anyone up, including it looked like normal telemetry data that would normally be sent. So looking inside it didn't trip any flags either. Like, yep, that's just some quality telemetry uh, data that was flowing out of there. No big deal, nothing there. It was only on the back end that they were actually diving in and using it for command and control and exfiltration. So they have the initial C2, the second C2. If you're not familiar with Cobalt Strike, you can look up that. That's another remote control uh, strike beacon. And all of this is being done outside of that server that was the initial attack. So if they got into the server that's running SolarWinds Orion, they move laterally in a network to start deploying all these things. So even if these were discovered, you didn't necessarily discover how it got there. So you could remove this, but it didn't necessarily answer the question of how. Now, Microsoft goes on further, and I'll leave a link to everything I mentioned here. And 
breaks down like all the finer details of exactly which DLL files were infected and how they sent some of the command and control. But let's talk about discovery real quick. And that comes to the Senate hearings with Kevin. I really liked his testimony and I'm going to play a little clip of it because it kind of gives you an idea of just how difficult this was to find and what they had to go through in order to turn their network inside out to discover this. But I want to explain how we found this implant because there's no magic wand to say where's the next implant. When we were compromised, we were set up to do that investigation. It's what we do. We put almost 100 people on this investigation. Almost all of them had 10,000 hours, there's so to speak, 10,000 hours of doing investigations. And we unearthed every clue we could possibly find. And we still didn't know, so how did the attacker break in? So we had to do extra work. And at some point in time, after exhausting every investigative lead, the only thing left was the earliest evidence of compromise was a solo wind server. And we had to tear it apart. And what I mean by that is we had to decompile it. Specifically, there was 18,000 files in the update, 3,500 executable files. We had over a million lines of assembly code. For those of you that haven't looked at assembly, you don't want to. It's something that you have to have specialized expertise to review, understand, piece apart. And we found the proverbial needle in the haystack, an implant. But how did we get there? Thousands of hours of humans investigating everything else. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I share that is you wonder why people missed it. This was not the first place you'd look. This was the last place you'd look for an intrusion. Million lines of assembly, thousands of hours by security researchers who do this for a living. They have the resources over at FireEye to throw at this project. It was on their own network. So it was, you know, it's taken personally, I'm sure that someone got in and they had to turn everything upside down to find it. It was a non-arbitrary task by a company specializing in it. So I think it really says a lot for the scale and scope. I mean, the defenses we have keep getting better and better. That means the adversaries have to work harder and harder to find their way in. So the complexity scale goes up and up on here. This was a absolute crazy attack from the perspectives we have today, it will be looked at as simple, like, oh, that was child's play to do something that complex sometime in the future, perhaps. But I think there's still a lot we don't know, like, was this used before? Did this get into other build servers? That's very speculative, I know, but it's still interesting to think about because we only know this, as I said, because FireEye was one of the people that were attacked and the threat actors made a mistake about registering a second phone that tripped FireEye to go, wait a minute, something's wrong, stop everything. We're going to turn our company inside out, upside down until we find this. So it was a lot to take in to really dive into all this. I'll leave links to everything and some of the research and uh, the way forward. That's the one thing I want to leave you with. Yes, we can do better. Uh, there are ways you can take and look at build servers and do side-by-side -side builds. Then that requires now them to compromise two build servers. More thorough audits can take place. And this isn't just a solar winds thing. Recently, I did a video called dependency confusion. And I bring that up because it was done by a security researcher for the good team. And the security researcher proved that he could hack many large companies by looking at their dependencies and creating external dependencies for them to pull in libraries and execute on their own build servers. And his attack was successful and paid out a bug bounty from companies like Shopify, Apple, and many others. So we do know there's still more flaws and still more tightening up that can be done at all these large companies. This is just the cat and mouse game that is, you know, keep building better defenses, better adversaries come at it, and better defenses get built. And uh, just figuring out where that spot is and doing everything we can all the time to defend it and being a better security ecosystem by sharing all the knowledge that can be shared to help get this word out there, get people to understand these threats are very real and get people thinking, especially at the development process of all the security implications that go on in this. Security really is a team sport and uh, all of us are on the same team. Even if we're defending, it's not a secret. It, we share this knowledge, we get it out there. And that's part of me doing you know, the videos that I do is just throwing more knowledge out there because uh, we all want to see things more secure and not happening like this for sure. All right, and thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from this channel, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. To hire a sure project, head over to lawrencesystems.com and click on the Hire Us button right at the top. 
To help this channel out in other ways, there is a join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page where your support is greatly appreciated. For deals, discounts, and offers, check out our affiliate links in the descriptions of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store where we have a wide variety of shirts and new designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics covered on this channel. Thank you again, and we look forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, check out some of our other videos.